I know you see a blank screen. I hope your minds are not that way, and I hope they're not that way after I get done with this lesson. I don't know about you, but life doesn't always go just the way we want it to go. Curtis is a great example of that just this morning. I'm sure he would rather be here than where he is. For some of you, maybe the daily schedules that you have all worked out, but they get jumbled up with the unexpected arrival of a phone call or an email. And then there's that illness like Curtis has that's keeping me in bed, out of commission for three or four days. Or maybe there's some kind of life-changing event that changes your entire outlook on life and on living. We've all been there. We've all had our schedules and agendas altered. It's a rather uncomfortable and disconcerting feeling. And in a greater and more general sense, life and living never seem to work out the way we've planned it or the way we want it to work out. We look back to years past and we know that the life we've lived wasn't at all what we thought it would be or perhaps even hoped that it would be. We know that life in the here and now, it's not perfect. It's not the way God designed it in the beginning. It's not the way it ought to be. It's not the paradise that it once was or will be at some time in the future. But it's what we have. It's where we are. It's where we live right now. And these glitches, I'll call them, some of them are relatively mild, cause minimal pain, but others can be and are life-altering. These unexpected detours mess up our schedules. They destroy our agendas. They decimate our dreams and our hopes, and they sometimes cause us even to say, where are you, God? Where are you when I really need you? Well, I want to look at a real-life example from Scripture of what I'm talking about. If we go again to the second gospel account of the life of Jesus in the book of Mark, we're going to find in, I think, the sixth chapter, a remarkable story that was written by Mark, as told to him, we think, by the apostle Peter who was there and who was an eyewitness of this incident that Mark is telling here in the sixth chapter. Now, I'll give you a little bit of background here. Jesus had chosen the men who were with him on the shore of the Sea of Galilee as his disciples. He wanted them to learn about him, Jesus. He wanted them to learn about the kingdom of God. He wanted them to be instruments later on in the work of the kingdom of God. Now, you need to understand this. Jesus' time with them was a preparation time. It was a time of learning, of refinement. It was a time of getting things put all together in their minds. And in the process of preparing his disciples for what was to come, Jesus sometimes had to run his disciples through some kind of, shall we say, difficulty. The normal agenda of the day was disrupted. The routine and the norm were not to be on that day. Their thinking and their thought processes had to be challenged. It was a time, as I said, of learning and preparation. He had already challenged them at the feeding of the 5,000. He had already taught them, he taught them the value of prayer with the driving out of the demons. He showed them what faith could do with the healing of the epileptic boy. And he tested their faith in the storm on the sea where he walked on the water to the boat. Mark recounts that story of the storm on the sea and the actions of the disciples and Jesus as they deal with a real life and death situation. I'm gonna read chapter six, verses 45 through 53. Directly after this, Jesus made his disciples get in the boat and go on ahead to Bethsaida on the other side of the lake, while he himself sent the crowds home. And when he had sent them all on their way, he went off to the hillside to pray. When it grew late, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was by himself on land, and he saw them straining at the oars, for the wind was dead against them. 
And in the small hours he went toward them, walking on the waters of the lake, intending to come alongside them. But when they saw him walking on the water, they thought he was a ghost, and they screamed out, for they all saw him, and they were absolutely terrified. But Jesus spoke at once quietly to them, It's all right. It is I myself. Don't be afraid. And he climbed aboard the boat with them, and the wind dropped. But they were scared out of their wits. They had not had the sense to learn even the lesson of the loaves. Even that miracle had not opened their eyes to see who he was. Okay, I want to look at this story a little more closely. Jesus had just fed a crowd that numbered about 5,000 men, along with women and children, from a couple of loaves of bread and some small fish. He'd been preaching to that crowd, and he knew that they were hungry. Jesus was, I venture to say, exhausted after this time with the crowd and his feeding of them. And if you've ever preached a sermon, you know that you get tired after you've preached a sermon. And I can just imagine Jesus with several thousand people teaching and preaching to them. So after the crowd dispersed, Jesus, wanting to be alone with God his Father, sent the disciples on ahead to the next place that they would go, to Bethsaida on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Now it was in this time period, Mark leaves out a lot of information in order to include, I think, just the important things here. Jesus was busy praying and communing with the Father, and the disciples were busy trying to keep the boat upright in the storm that had come up when they got out onto the water. Now the time cues in this story suggest about an eight hour period of time. This story takes place from evening when Jesus dismissed his disciples until, as some translations say, the fourth watch of the night. That's about three o'clock in the morning. Normally, it would take just a few hours, maybe three hours or so, to row that eight miles across the sea. But the disciples, some of whom were seasoned fishermen and sailors, were nowhere near the opposite shore. Mark says they were in the middle of the sea. And they'd been rowing against the wind for several hours. It was not a pleasant stroll across the lake. The disciples, it appears, from Mark's account, were rather helpless against this storm. They'd been rowing for hours. They'd not made very much headway. They'd only gotten out into the middle of the lake, about four miles out. They were tired, very tired. They were tired after the feeding of the 5,000. Think about several hours later, after rowing against the wind and the waves in the sea and the storm, they were worn out after several hours of fighting this storm. They were in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. There was nothing much they could do. They were in quite the predicament. They were in fear for their lives. They had done everything that they had known to do. They were in the middle of the sea with no way out of that situation. How'd they get into this mess? How'd they get into this mess? Did they just unilaterally decide to go on ahead and leave Jesus back on the shore? Did they not know how to handle a boat? Did they not know how to read the weather? Were they incompetent somehow or another? Were, were they insubordinate? Did they go on ahead even though Jesus told them not to? No. Look at what Mark says. Jesus made them, Mark says, get into the boat and start for the other side. Now that word there that's translated made in modern translations is more accurately translated as compelled. Compelled. The word is a command word. Perhaps the modern equivalent that might be an order in the military given by a superior to someone less in rank. It was an order. Now, I don't know whether they were reluctant to get in the boat at first, and Jesus said, no, you go. My guess is, 
My guess is that at least some of them knew that there may well be a storm coming up by looking at the clouds and the way things were. And they may have been reluctant to even get in the boat in the first place. But I think Jesus knew about the storm. He hadn't come yet, at least on shore, but I think he knew about the storm. And I think Jesus knew that they wouldn't go out on their own in the storm. I think Jesus knew that he would have to compel them to get in a boat and go to the other side. And I think Jesus knew exactly what would happen and what he was going to do. I think Jesus intentionally sent them into that storm, intentionally sent them into that mess. This is God's doing. This wasn't the doing of the disciples. I think they didn't want to go. I think that's why Jesus had to give them, had to issue an order. You know, we thank God for the obvious blessings. We thank God for good food, for air conditioning, for jobs, for family, for good health. We thank God for all of that and even more. And that's good. But do we also thank God for the blessings of trial? Those things that don't seem to be blessings. You know, sometimes God sends us, I think, into his mess. And instead of thanking him for the refinement and the maturity and the growth that those messes bring, we often find ourselves asking, where are you, God? What are you doing? Why aren't you answering my prayers? Are you even there? I think God is preparing us for a time not yet. The here and now is not all there is. We are being prepared for something. But instead of understanding that we're being prepared and refined for the life to come, I think we moan and groan about how bad we have it in the here and in the now. God knows what he's doing. We're being prepared for something. I think we're being prepared for a life that is beyond the here and now. Remember what Paul said, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, about the difficulties that he and the other apostles and evangelists had faced. This is what he said. We do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day for our light And momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory. An eternal glory. That far outweighs them all. And so we fix our eyes not what is seen, but but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Knowing what Paul and others faced in that time period... To hear him describe those troubles that they went through as, how did he say it? Light and momentary. That seems awfully foreign to us. Yet it would do us good to consider Paul's words and give heed to them. Well, in any event, Jesus somehow sees his disciples about four miles away rowing against the storm. Hey, is that a miracle in and of itself? He's on shore. The disciples are four miles away in the middle of a storm, and he sees them, Mark says. I quote here, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he, Jesus, was by himself on land. He saw them straining at the oars, for the wind was dead against them. Now remember, I think this is no surprise to Jesus. Remember, he's the one that sent them into the storm. He's the one that compelled them to get into the boat. He's the one that gave the order. 
And remember, he's the Lord of the wind and the waves. I think he knew all about the storm. He didn't look up from his prayers, suddenly see the disciples out there, and with, with surprise and dismay, decided that he had made a mistake in sending them out, and now he has to do something to fix it. He didn't look out on the water, see the disciples in trouble, and say, oh my goodness, I'm the Messiah, I sent them out there, I have to do something. Jesus purposed this moment for the disciples. Jesus purposed this time. And then he does something really remarkable. He walks into the storm to be with the disciples. Now think of it. Think of it. He goes into this mess that he purposed in order to be with those that he loves while they're in the middle of the mess. And think of this. If the object of his going out there was to calm the storm, he didn't have to do that in order to calm the storm. He didn't have to walk out there in order to calm the storm. He could have waved his hand, said some words or whatever right there in the safety of the land, and the storm would have immediately subsided. He wouldn't have had to have been out there. If Jesus wanted to calm the storm right then while he was on safe land, he could have done so without all the drama of walking on the water and the disciples being further scared out of their wits by their thinking that they had seen a ghost. Jesus is choosing to enter into this moment with the disciples. He is choosing to enter into the storm with his disciples. Jesus is choosing to enter into this mess that his disciples are in. We sometimes, you know, don't like God's agenda. We want things to be predictable. We want things to be comfortable. We want things to go the way we want them to go. We want God to make sure that things happen the way we want them to happen. But you see, God has his own agenda. God has his own plans. God has his own plan for us. God has his own way of working. Sometimes God chooses to calm the storm. And sometimes God chooses to walk into the storm with us. So Jesus goes out into the boat, or out into the, goes out to the boat, intending to come alongside the disciples. Some translations say pass by the disciples. Others say come alongside or come beside. I don't think it matters much. The word that Mark uses here actually can have either meaning. But before he gets alongside them, they see him. And they think they're seeing a ghost. They think they're seeing a spirit. They think they're seeing some kind of an apparition. And they cry out in holy terror. But Jesus calmly says to them, in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the waves, in the midst of the wind... It is I. Don't be afraid. Now, I'll tell you, our translations don't do a real good job with this. In their quest to make the English more readable, the translation, I think, loses the importance of what he's really saying here. Jesus, in reality here, states his name. And then he says, don't be afraid. It is I, in the original language, is the same expression, exact same expression that Jesus uses in John chapter 8 when Jesus tells the Pharisees who were arguing with him about Abraham before Abraham was, what did he say? I am. And 
And the Pharisees immediately, immediately knew that Jesus was telling them that he was God himself. And they picked up stones to kill him. The phrase is exactly the same. Jesus is saying, I am here. I'm not a Greek person, but I think it's pronounced ego I me. I am. Jesus is saying, I am is here. You don't need to be afraid. He asserts his deity to the disciples by this statement. Don't you understand, Jesus, I think, is trying to say? Don't you understand that the I am is here, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is with you. The God of whom all of the covenant promises rest is here, in the here and now, in the storm with you. Well, to put it mildly, <laughs> the disciples were astonished. This shouldn't have been a surprise to them since they just saw him feed 5,000 men plus women and children with a few fish and loaves. But you see, they still didn't understand. Mark says, and so they were indeed surprised, scared, and astonished to see Jesus in this way. The disciples, Mark says, didn't get it. They didn't understand. They were unprepared to meet God incarnate in this storm. And this isn't the first time they've seen the divinity of Jesus. They should be beginning to understand by now. Hmm. And how much are we like the disciples? Are we any more prepared than the disciples to allow God to walk in the storm with us? Do we get God's agenda? Do we understand that we're being prepared in the here and now for a time that is not yet? Do we understand that God in his grace and in his mercy is rebuilding us? He's refining us. He's remaking us. He's remolding us. He's reshaping us. Or are we only concerned with our own agenda? We want the grace of relief. We want the grace of release. We want the grace of ease. We want the grace of comfort. But remember, this is God's agenda that we're living this is God's plan for us that we're experiencing. This is God's way of preparing us for what is to come. So many times, instead of the grace of ease and comfort and release and relief, we receive the grace of refinement. We receive the grace of difficulty. We receive the grace of preparation the grace of remolding, the grace of reshaping, the grace of remaking. Uncomfortable grace, it's called. We want grace that's a soft pillow and a cool drink. Sometimes it is. But often I think grace comes to us as a hammer and a fire of refinement. You can be far more resistant to uncomfortable grace than you think you are. Your heart could be harder than you think it is. You can be in the boat, just like the disciples, wondering where God is, and he's there with you. And he's been there all along. God will take you where you hadn't intended to go 
in order to produce in you what you couldn't otherwise achieve on your own. And I'll say it again. God will take you where you hadn't intended to go in order to produce in you what you couldn't achieve on your own. I'm going to deviate from my notes here just for a second. Some of you who are my Facebook friends may have seen this post that I posted a few days ago. A friend of one of my Facebook friends posted this on her Facebook page. She, just like my Facebook friend, has been battling addiction for years. And this is what she said on her post. I didn't find God at church. I found him on my bathroom floor, hysterically crying, begging for him to stop the pain and heal my heart. And my friend posted back. It is God there with us on the bathroom floor. It is God there with us on the bathroom floor. But boy, have we used his community. That's you. Have we used his community to apply the bandages afterwards and warm the bath water to start again. I've found both. Both God on the floor and the community. I think that's uncomfortable grace. We think that the grace of God gives us healing from disease, protection from lawlessness, and the comfort of life in the Western world. Sometimes God does favor us with these things. But true grace, true grace, God's grace is God's rebuilding you. It's God's refining you. It's God's training and testing you, not for living in the here and now, but preparing you from what you signed up for. You've signed up for life for eternity. That's what you signed up for when you stepped across the line of faith. And God is doing this. He's doing this preparing. He's doing this refining. He's doing this testing for no other reason than his own grace and glory. We don't deserve any of it, nothing, none. But God in his glory has decided to just, I can't even read. God in his glory has decided to bestow on us something that we have not earned and do not deserve. Uncomfortable grace. God is with us in the storm.